In custom car audio, we use crossovers in order to limit the bandwidth of musical frequencies that can reach our speakers. This allows us to avoid having smaller speakers playing bass and easily being damaged, and it helps us prevent larger speakers from needing to play high frequency information, muddying the sound. But with a custom audio system, we can have crossover settings on our head unit, on our amplifiers, and if it is part of our system, our DSP. Which device should we be using to set our crossovers? And is there a reason for using multiple crossovers on different devices? I'm Mark, welcome to Car Audio Fabrication, the show where together we learn how to master car audio and how to design, build, and install our dream car audio system. In this video, we're gonna talk about crossover terminology and we're gonna take some measurements of crossovers and determine how we can decide what is best for different systems. Once we understand crossovers and where we should have them in our system, we're gonna get better performance and our system is going to be more reliable so let's get into this. So I've got everything set up here for a good test setup. I'm going to explain all this to you in a second. But first of all, I want to talk about crossover terminology just to make sure that we're all on the same page. First off, understand that there's three main types of crossover. We know that a crossover limits the frequencies that are coming out of our amplifier and going to our speakers at a certain point. So the best way to look at different crossovers is on a graph. We have hertz on this frequency, which would be 20 hertz up to 20,000 hertz. In other words, our low base up to our highest of highs. And then on the x-axis here is our output level. So the higher up it is on this axis, the louder it is. With a low pass crossover, we're only allowing the lows below a certain point to go past. So let's say, for example, that this was at 100 hertz. Everything below 100 hertz would play but once we got to 100 hertz and started getting higher, that output would roll off. So a low pass is something that you would use for a subwoofer because you want the lower frequencies to go past. A high pass crossover is basically the opposite of low pass. Now at a certain value, we're only allowing values higher than that to go past. Everything below it is going to be cut. So again, an example, at 100 hertz, we're allowing everything above 100 hertz to go past, but below 100 hertz, we're cutting it off. A high pass is something that you be likely to use for a tweeter because you want everything above a certain value to go past to the tweeter, but we want to limit the bass frequencies so we don't hurt that speaker. The final crossover category is a band pass. This is a combination of both a high pass and a low pass filter, and this would be used for something like a mid-range speaker because we don't want it to play subwoofer frequencies. We don't want it to play tweeter frequencies. We want it to play in between, so we use a band pass. Now, another crossover type you may have heard of is called a subsonic crossover and that's basically used on subwoofer amplifiers and all it really is is a high pass filter that makes it so that we don't play bass that is far too low that exceeds the capabilities of the subwoofer and potentially damages it. Now one more thing we should know about all these different types of crossovers is they can change based on their frequency set point but they can also change based on their slope. So the slope is how fast or how slow the frequency increases or rolls off. We can actually understand this pretty well just by looking at this graphic here on our head unit, we're currently at a 24 dB slope, meaning it's pretty steep. If we go less steep, now it's only a 12 dB slope. Now, in order to know how to really set up your system for the best performance, you need to know at what value you wanna set those crossovers. You also need to know what slope you wanna use. This is a bit more of an advanced topic that I made a video about in the past. You can check it out at the link in the corner of the screen. If you guys have any more questions about this, let me know. But otherwise, I hope that we're all on the same page because now we can move on and talk about our test setup. We're going to be playing pink noise, and if I turn this up, you'll be able to hear what this sounds like and then I'm going to show you what it looks like over here. Hopefully you guys can hear me but it basically sounds like static and if we look at our electrical measurement here you can see what pink noise looks like. It's just a flat frequency response. And now I've gone behind the head unit and I've just disconnected the speakers. That way we don't have to listen to this while I explain everything to you, but you can still see that we have musical output out of our head unit. This is what pink noise looks like on our RTA graph. And if you notice, this graph is the same as before. We have frequency down here and then we have output here. 
So we are all set up here and ready to test some crossovers. I do wanna give a quick shout out to show sponsor Audio Control and tell you guys a little bit more about the DMRTA because this tool is extremely powerful for tuning your custom car audio system. First off, we can take electrical measurements like we are here to make sure that we have the right frequency response that we need for our system. We can also connect a microphone and as part of the Pro Kit, you get all this different stuff. One of the things being a really nice high-end measurement microphone along with a nice long cable to get into the vehicle. They've got a ton of different connections here so that we can connect to our speaker wires and measure the electrical signal. They've got different USB connections. This is currently connected to a computer running the program, but you don't necessarily have to have a computer because you could also plug this in and this allows you to connect via Bluetooth to a mobile device. This can run on battery power like it currently is, but you can also plug it in and charge it with this AC adapter here. They also give you an adapter so that you can plug into the cigarette lighter of a car so you can be charging while you're doing a long tuning session in a vehicle. And you even get that sweet, sweet audio control guitar pick that allows you to adjust the little settings on amplifiers. Obviously the case is included too, a really nice solid case to protect that investment. If you guys are interested in this, audio control is super cool and they're actually hooking up car audio fabrication fans with a special discount for a limited time. You guys can learn all about that special offer for the DMRTA Pro Kit down in the video description. So which device should we use to set our crossover? Well, let's go into the crossover settings here on our head unit and I'm gonna go ahead and turn this crossover off for right now. So we have no crossover applied, which you can see here, we have full output from 20 hertz all the way up to 20,000. Now I'm gonna go ahead and turn on the crossover and right now the setting that we are on is for the front setting, which is going to be front speakers. So it's going to give us a high pass filter. And the reason for that is usually on our front speakers, we're wanting to cut off some of the bass information because we're going to allow our subwoofer to play that. So right now we have a high pass filter. Let's move it up and set it Let's see here, let's put it at 125 hertz and we've got 24 dB per octave. So as you can see on our measurement here, depending on the crossover, the way it usually works is it will actually start rolling off a little bit above your set point frequency. So we can see 125 hertz is right here. We've got our roll off. Let's change that slope slightly just so you guys can see real time. It's still 24 dB and I'm gonna change it to 12 dB. And there you can see that slope change. So by playing around with our head unit here, we've identified a couple of things. First of all, we can know the exact set point that our crossover is at just because of the nature of this design, it's telling us an exact value. Right now we're at 125 hertz exactly. Right now we're at 80 hertz exactly. We can also identify exactly which slope we are using. So let's keep all of that in mind and next let's investigate our amplifier. So I've now defeated the crossover on the head unit and we are connected with the DMRTA to our amplifier only and we're going to adjust this crossover and see what happens on our graph. This is a mids and highs amplifier so the lowest value here on the crossover is 30 hertz and we're currently set at that lowest value which we can see here on screen. I can adjust this setting here and with a good reputable amplifier manufacturer, usually you can get pretty close to the actual labeled frequency here on the dial. But because this is just a dial and not an actual digital readout, we are kind of just guessing and assuming that we're at a certain crossover value. I will say that right now, if I put this at 120 Hertz, this does have the roll off I would expect. It does appear to be accurate on this amplifier. But the other thing to consider is with most amplifier crossovers, if we look in the manual here, we can see on this one, this has 12 dB per octave crossovers. So in other words, although we can adjust the set point, we cannot adjust the slope. Now to be clear, the lack of slope adjustment on this particular amplifier, that doesn't make this a bad amplifier. That's why things like DSPs exist or advanced control on some of our newer head units that are having new features exist. It gives us more control over the sound. So now I can give you my opinion. My opinion for what we should use to set the crossovers is to use the device that gives us the most control. In this particular case, when comparing these two different pieces of gear, the head unit is going to give us the most control for setting our crossover. But I do wanna expand on this a little bit more because there is something that I really, really like about our amplifier still having a crossover. What I really like about amplifiers having a crossover and using a crossover on both the head unit 
and the amplifier is the added level of protection. So to understand what I mean, let's say that we're running these two six and a half inch woofers in the front of our vehicle. And let's say that we're using an amplified system. So this amplifier is powering those speakers. We don't want these speakers to be playing anything that is subwoofer based frequencies because it could potentially damage them, especially since we are amplifying them. So we're gonna set our crossover, let's say at a value of 80 Hertz on our head unit. So we're currently at 80 Hertz on the head unit and we've essentially completely defeated this crossover, turning it to its lowest value. This is what this looks like on our measurement. And I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to store this measurement. Now what I wanna do is I wanna come over to the amplifier here and I'm gonna adjust the crossover up to, let's say, maybe just a little bit above 40 Hertz. Now, if we look at our measurement coming out of the amplifier, we can see that that adjustment on the amplifier's crossover it really didn't do anything. It's keeping the exact same frequency response as before. We can barely see our ghosted measurement behind there. So really no change. But the value that this represents is now, let's say that somebody disconnects the battery in our head unit, or let's say that somebody comes in here and they mess with the features, or worst case scenario, they accidentally turn off the crossover. When the crossover on the head unit is now defeated, we still have the crossover enabled on our amplifier. So we can see here that we have a little bit more of output in the lower frequencies, but it's not gonna be enough output that once you get into the subwoofer range, of frequencies that it could potentially hurt these speakers. So in summary, although I would probably use the head unit for setting my crossovers because it gives us more flexibility, it is still beneficial to have the crossover in the amplifier for protection in case something happens here. The thing you do want to be careful about is you wouldn't want to set the head unit crossover and the amplifier crossover at the same value because basically what it's going to do is it's going to add those slopes. So now I would have a 24 dB per octave slope plus a 12 dB per octave slope. It would essentially give us a steeper 36 dB per octave slope cutoff, which might not be what we want for our particular application. Again, you can learn more about the slope that you would want in my related video. As a side note, I do wanna be clear that there are going to be times that you're gonna need a crossover that the head unit will likely not provide. An example of this is let's say instead of doing an active two-way setup like this with a tweeter and a woofer, let's say that we're doing a three-way setup that has a woofer, a three-inch mid-range speaker, and a tweeter. In that case, for the tweeter, we'd be using the high pass. For the woofer, we'd be using the low pass but for that three inch mid-range speaker, we're likely going to need to use a bandpass crossover. And this is something that if you have a six channel amplifier like this one here, you will see that we have the ability to do a bandpass crossover with both a high pass and low pass combination. Our head unit does not have six individual outputs. It does not have a bandpass crossover. So the whole point of me making this video is I want you guys to understand that you really need to analyze your application and determine for each individual speaker where would be the best location to set it. Again, using what gives us the control that we need for our application. Now at this point, if we were doing a six channel active system, we're starting to get much more advanced into the point that you would likely want to use a digital signal processor. A DSP would take the signal out of the head unit into it, and then you can adjust that signal prior to going out and into the amplifier. In a system setup like that, where you're going from the head unit to the DSP to the amp, I would recommend defeating all of the settings on the head unit here because you're gonna have more control on the DSP. So again, that rule of wanting to use whatever has the most control is going to apply. We've defeated this, this gives us more control in the DSP using the computer software. But again, my other rule of making sure that you have some sort of protection also applies because now if anything does happen to our DSP settings, if we set it incorrectly, if it somehow does a reset, we now still have that protection on our amplifier. I do wanna mention really quick too that the most important speakers you're going to want to be really really careful about with your crossovers are tweeters. Tweeters are obviously small and they're very prone to being damaged by powerful bass frequencies. So I also have another related video that you guys can check out where you can learn more about protecting tweeters specifically. A special thanks to Audio Control for being a monthly channel sponsor. Learn more about the DMRTA Pro Kit and take advantage of that special offer. It's limited time for Car Audio Fabrication fans at the link down in the video description. Also, special thanks to Mike, Ron, Ali, Jerry, Marcos, William, and the rest of the Patreon membership team. A big thanks to all those guys for making these videos possible, and thank you for watching.